I think we got to talk GBTC, right? Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Dude, Ugh. first off, I just want to say, like, you know, we are uh, connected to all the, I guess, the different yeah. groups involved in this. Your podcast that you did. I don't know how many emails I got with people clipping your podcast and sending me uh, uh, parts from it. The entire GBTC community saw it. You did a great job uh, and kudos to you, man. I know that's awkward to do, um, but dude, it it needed to be said. So kudos. There was no plan to it. It was funny. Uh, During it, Danny thought I'd softballed him. There was no plan. Uh, When we sat down, you know, uh, we got a beer, we had a chat, and and I just started asking about the background. And I, you know, as I was doing it, I was realizing, you know, hold on, if you knew that, you should have known this. So we just walked through it, and then by the end, I was like, hi, I, I don't believe you. And so there was no plan to it; it just happened the way it was. Um, I would still sit down with him again. I, I, he did exactly what I, I thought he would do, and I think what he had to do. But at the same time, I just didn't, I didn't believe him. Well, dude, you know, I've, I've invited him to speak at the Bitcoin conference. Uh, we're having a, a shareholder, we're calling a shareholder meetup because we can't call a shareholder meeting uh, legally. It's the trust documents forbid us from doing that. So we're having a shareholder meetup and there's a bunch of GBTC shareholders that are going to be there. We have content about the trust, what's being done to bust the trust. And we've reserved time for Michael to speak to the shareholders. And like it's the largest gathering, as far as we're aware, of shareholders in one place. So if he wants to speak to his customers, he wants to speak to his shareholders, we have a spot for him. So far, he has not responded to our offer. Um, so, you know, if you could put in a good word for us, please do. Dude, he unfollowed me on Twitter. <laughs> Brutal. Yeah, he unfollowed me. Um, so where do you want to start about GBTC? There's well, a lot there. Give people the TLDR, the ones who didn't listen to that show, who maybe don't don't know exactly what's going on. Okay, so there's so many layers to the story. I'm going to do just the highest level job of it, but we can dive deeper where you find, I guess, maybe most interest. So uh, GBTC is a trust product created by Grayscale, which is a company owned by DCG, which is owned by Barry Silbert. Barry Silbert's a Bitcoin OG. DCG is one of the oldest companies in our industry. Um, This trust is one of like 16 trusts that they operate where basically you park cryptocurrency inside the trust. The two biggest trusts are GBTC, uh, which holds Bitcoin, and ETHE, which owns Ethereum. Um, And then those trusts, the shares of those trusts, they trade on the secondary market, um, like in your IRA or your 401k, or like you just, you know, go on to Fidelity or or, uh, Scott Trade, whatever, and type in those tickers and and buy it. Um, Those holdings of those two trusts, um, GBTC and ETH, the rest are pretty small, but those two is worth like uh, roughly $25 billion to $30 billion right now. That's how much uh, crypto they're holding. Um, for Specifically for GBTC, they're holding 630,000 Bitcoins, which makes it the world's largest holding of Bitcoin. Um, but because of some sketchy shit that has been done at the DCG uh, family of companies, and because of some um, uh, unethical, duplicitous behavior from the management at Grayscale, um, the value of those shares that people bought, which are supposed to reflect the holding of those assets, are trading at a massive discount. So right now, GBTC is trading at a 40% discount to the value of the asset. So let's say it's sitting on, hypothetically, um, uh, $15 billion in Bitcoin. These are just rough numbers, $15 billion in Bitcoin. Right now it's trading at, you know, let's call it uh, $9 billion yeah. uh, as this valuation. And ETH, it's even worse. I think it's like a 60% discount to the, the assets that it's holding. So um, there are roughly 850,000 shareholders of GBTC, almost a million people. Um, they're collectively down on this uh, trade, like, uh, let's call it $10, $10 billion. Um, and a lot of these people, they actually bought these shares at a time when they were trading at a premium. So like a, there was one point in time where the value of the shares were worth more than the assets underpinning them. So maybe I bought the shares at a 30% premium and now we're at a 40% discount. So I've actually lost like 70, 80%. Um, and so like the scale of this situation is like, uh, uh, it is, I, in my opinion, bigger than FTX Alameda. 
Um, it is, uh, you know, FTX had a couple million customers um, and they lost $8 billion, um, like or $9 billion. Most of it will be recovered. Uh, you know, with, with this situation, you have uh, Grayscale that's lost shit. Um, 15, 16 billion dollars between ETH E and GBTC, you know, reflecting a million and a half shareholders. And that doesn't include Genesis, which is deeply con- connected to the story, which is another company owned by DCG, um, which is has maybe 400,000 creditors. Uh, you might know the, the number better than I. Uh, I don't know uh, the number. Uh, and they've, uh, they've lost those creditors five billion dollars. So taken together, like this is way bigger than FTX. Um, and I actually think it's like maybe at the source of a lot of the frauds that happened over the past year really can be explained by behavior coming from this DCG uh, criminal enterprise. Whew. All right, bold statement. Um, so we'll come back to the Genesis part. So Michael Sunshine said to me, he he's working tirelessly w- uh, in the best interest of GBTC shareholders. Uh, but my understanding is that there is a way of closing the NAV now. Yeah. And that's to do with the the, the uh, commission they take. Yeah, well, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff they could do. Um, you know, first off, like, uh, according to some people we've talked to, one of, one of the things that make the biggest impact is there's all these sketchy inter-party dealings happening between Grayscale and Genesis and DCG. If they would just, re- like, pull back the curtain, reveal all the inter-party conflicts, all the inter-party transactions, and just were fully open Komodo transparent with people about what's happened, that would bring back confidence in the, in, at least in the management team and the business. And like that alone would improve the situation without costing a dollar. Now they can't do that because they've done some really shady shit that they'd get in trouble for. And that's like why they don't want to like go open Komodo. The next thing that they could do is like they could just charge like fees that are commercially standard that are similar to what anyone else would charge for a similar product. Instead, they're charging these exorbitant fees that are uh, based off the NAV, which is the Mm. assets that are being held and not the actual value of the business. And so the effective fees that are being charged is like 4% per year. So when it's, when you're looking at like, if I'm a shareholder or investor and I'm looking at which trust do I invest into and there's this trust that holds Bitcoin and it charges, you know, 0.75 of a percent. And there's this trust over here that charges effectively 4%. I'm picking the one that's cheaper. Like I, why would I pick the one that's charging me 4% a year? So if they could just make their, their, their fees competitive, um, that would improve the situation. And then maybe the question that somebody listening to this would have is like, okay, well, if their fees are such a ripoff, why don't people leave? And that's the real root of the issue, which is that you're not allowed to leave. Um, they have no redemption program, uh, uh, even though they have the full ability to implement a redemption program immediately. They choose not to because that would result in lower fees. And instead, they create this uh, narrative that they are aggressively pursuing becoming an ETF through suing the SEC. Um, and dragging out this long process while this entire time they're just chipping away uh, at the amount of Bitcoin that are sitting there by charging these exorbitant fees. So it's it's a it's a tough situation. And one thing I think you asked him this was like, why why don't you lower your fees? No, I didn't, like, I didn't. I didn't. You know what? It was on my list, and I didn't because we got to the point where he was he was getting told to leave. <laughs> So, you know, he keeps saying it like in in interviews, like, hey, we're committed to lowering our fee once we become an ETF. That makes no sense. An ETF costs more to run than a closed in trust does. Like with an ETF, you have a redemption program. You have to basically process withdrawals every day. Like there's a lot of work to, to run an ETF. With this trust, you do nothing. They're not even, they don't create shares. They don't redeem shares. The Bitcoin just sits there. All they do is file with the SEC. So like their costs are going to go way up when they become an ETF. So um, the only reason they would lower their fees if they became an ETF is because you have the ability to leave and everyone would leave at their current fees. So uh, um, it's, uh, it, you but, know, but my, at, two, at 2%, they, do they charge it on the Bitcoin? And if so, that's what, 12,000 bit, 12, 12, 12, 12, 13,000 Bitcoins a year. Yeah. 13,000 Bitcoin a year. So that's about 400 million. Yeah. It's yeah. like the most profitable trust in the world. Yeah. So the, the 
you know, if you were cynical, you would say the incentive here is to drag this out as long, long as possible because, you know. Never you, redeem. Yeah, if you can drag it out for three years, you've made over a billion. And if the Bitcoin price goes up and doubles, it's two and a half billion. So there's, a, there's an incentive to keep people trapped within this. Has anyone run the calculation how many years it would take for them to essentially have half that Bitcoin as theirs? Well, uh, no, uh, but eventually you could drain it down to zero and take a, yeah. a long time. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, that's my opinion of what's what's happening. And the thing is, is like if the price of Bitcoin 10x is their fees 10x. So like if the price of Bitcoin goes up 10x, they're going to be making three billion a year in fees for doing the same work that they were doing back when they were making 10 million a year in fees. And the only reason they get to charge that is because they won't let people leave. So uh, um, I, I've been told this is like we're, we're entering into the speculative realm because I can't verify this myself. But I've been told that even if Grayscale wins their lawsuit against the SEC to become an ETF, that they intend on having a multi-year period to actually convert into an ETF. Of so course. so even if they win and they get approval for their ETF, it's not like, hey, we're opening up. It's like, yeah, we're opening up. In a few years, once we've extracted, you know, another 50,000, 60,000 Bitcoins from this thing. So, uh, you know, my kind of like mind, like, like the moment I realized that we were screwed was like when, because I'm a shareholder of this thing and I've lost mm. a few million bucks in it. So like the, the moment I realized that we were screwed is like, I had always bought into this, this story that they wanted to become an ETF. Like I thought they were being honest about that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm down with the cause. I want, I want to see that happen. Like I'm, I'm in this fight with y'all. Well, when I ran the map, the numbers and I realized like, okay, they have 3.3% of the world's Bitcoin. They're charging 2% of NAV for them to be an ETF, like the best rate they're going to be able to charge, like, like the, like the worst rate they can get away with is like 75 basis points. Okay, well, at 75 basis points, they've reduced their fees that they're making, their income, by, by two-thirds. They're making one-third of what they used to make. So uh, assuming no one leaves the, the trust when they open it up to become an ETF, they would need to 3x the amount of Bitcoin they're holding in order to make the same amount of revenue they're making right now. And when you have 3.3% of the world's Bitcoin supply, 3xing that means you'd have to have 10% of the world's Bitcoin supply. Where are they going to get another uh, uh, 2 million Bitcoins? There's only like a million something Bitcoins on all the exchanges globally. So there's not even enough liquid Bitcoin out there for them to even get enough into their, into their uh, ETF to make the same amount of money they're making now. So if you just take the perspective, like they're going to follow the profit maximizing path, the profit maximizing path is never become an ETF never open for redemptions, fight off every lawsuit that comes at you and just drain this thing for as long as possible.